My name is Chris Cirillo and I'm the owner of Kodiak Bodybuilding Apparel. In 2017, I was working as a third party contractor for a well-known supplement company. Part of my job was to travel to various supplement stores and help the associates sell products. In my travels, I met someone who had become a very close friend of mine, Chris Mulder. In 2018, Chris's life as he knew it would crumble before his eyes. He was let go from his job, his wife filed for divorce, and shortly after he was diagnosed with lung cancer. The doctors gave him a few months to live. But Chris had decided in his mind that that was not the case. The following year, a mutual friend, Chaz Jones, was organizing a powerlift meet to benefit local veterans called Victory for Vets. Bedridden and lacking the strength to hold his own son, Chris had made it a goal to participate in this event. Chris's story is a testament to perseverance, mental toughness, and the power of positive thinking. He is a hero and an inspiration to all who know him. This is the story of the devil dog marine that refused to surrender. So definitely uh, 2018 was definitely the most defining year for myself as an individual. Um, pretty much started in the first, uh, first month in January. Um, by the end, I got let go of my job. Uh, 12 days after being let go from my job, uh, wife decided at the time she wanted a divorce and uh, pretty much was broke. I think we had about $7.95 in our account. At that point, fast forward a little bit to save some time. Life was starting to get a little bit better. Um, during the career change, it took about five months to find a new job in my career change. Uh, I was working two minimum wage jobs, which the struggle was real. And then with that, pretty much um, got into the IT field. Things were going good, didn't feel well. Tried going to the doctors, I believe it was September. At that time, didn't have health insurance yet, saw how much it would have cost if I would have continued to go through. So I was like, ah, I'm not that sick. Made up the, the mindset I'm either gonna live or die and um, kept pushing on where I was spiking fevers and everything else. Fast forward that to a month to October. Went in for the doctor when I finally got health insurance um, for my new job. And uh, when I went in, I actually got a reading on the O2 sensor, which measures your oxygen in your bloodstream. I was about, 80, about 82 to 83, where the average person should be anywhere from 98 to 100%. The fact that I was carrying sentences and everything else, uh, my, uh, I forget what you call it, the primary care physician was, uh, kind of shocked and baffled because I was carrying full sentences, exercising, and um, pretty much just living a normal life. Just felt fatigued and tired. So she sent me home, and after I went home, I got a phone call because she consulted with her husband, which was a, a surgeon in one of the local hospitals, and said, you need to send this individual to the hospital, and she told me I need to go to the ER and check myself in quick. So at that time, um, in October, went to the ER, I checked myself in, said I had low oxygen, there's a long wait. I guess apparently if you have low oxygen, you get taken right away. Uh, I got pulled into the back, they took x-rays of my chest, and it um, looked like both lungs were just filled with cotton balls. And at first they thought I had really bad pneumonia or a fungal infection. Fast forward a little bit more, at that time we couldn't figure out what was completely wrong with me, so we did a lung biopsy. When we did the lung biopsy, it caused um, a part of my lung, was, I believe it was the right side, to collapse, and uh, they ended up having to put a chest tube in. The funny story about the chest tube is they forgot to turn the vacuum on. It went over six hours where the doctor explained to me what was happening when they turned the vacuum finally on. I'd breathe in, I'd receive air, but when I'd exhale, the carbon monoxide wasn't releasing, which caused both lungs to actually collapse because they were coming back into my room, taking x-rays of my chest, and my lungs were actually getting worse, collapsing, um, then improving at this point. So he turned on the vacuum. Um, I would say probably about a day or two after getting the lung biopsy, we got it back where they diagnosed me with cancer. Um, at this point, they didn't know what type of cancer I had. Once I got notified I had cancer, my dad actually does work for UPMC. Um, some people we worked with pulled some strings and got me a request to transfer hospitals. 
at this point um, the best option for me because at this point uh, when I was at the one hospital they did not know what type of cancer I had or did they want to start treatment until my cough disappeared. The reason why that's important, I'll get to that in a second, is um, they didn't want to start treatment until the cough disappeared but the cough was created because I had two at this time. They thought I had stage three. They said there was nodules but no tumors. Um, where eventually I found out I had two mucus producing tumors in my lungs where I was producing over three liters of mucus a day and that's why I was coughing so much just to get the mucus out. When you go to the hospital sometimes you might see these bags they uh, gave me a bunch of them over here um, and this is how we knew how much mucus I was producing over a day so there was measurements and uh, pretty much every day I'd fill up one of these bags and that's how they knew I was filling up three liters of mucus a day and um, just so you have a heads up, I just have to carry these around on me in my pocket and spit my mucus because I was spitting so much from the mucus producing tumor. So at this point, we transfer down to Shady Side to work hand in hand with the Hillman Cancer Center. Um, probably within three to four days of being down at uh, Hillman, I went through multiple scans um, and tests and everything where um, I got put under Dr. Stanley Mark's team and then at this time I was working with Dr. Petro and Dr. Barantla where they came in, were reading the files and that's where I found out I had the, I might be saying it wrong, like the carcinoma bile duct cancer. So pretty much I found out at this moment when they came in and pretty much explained it to me. Um, when they finally said, oh, yo, you got cancer, the first response was, I did have like a little chuckle just because the way 2018 was going in it was just like okay it could be worse and at the same time it was like you gotta be kidding me um, where it was just at that time it was just it was kind of funny to me um, where they thought I needed to speak to a shrink um, fast forward a little bit eventually when they did ask for a shrink to come into my room um, this young cute girls my family said came in prancing in she must have been new to the job roughly a month there, and she's like, well, Mr. Moore, would you like to speak to somebody? And my response in an angry tone was just like, can they cure cancer? And um, she said, no, sir, they can't. I said, well, then get the fuck out. So that was like kind of like the tone because like, cancer's cancer, it is what it is. And um, whether you talk about it or not, it's still there, it's not gonna go away. Um, where I just didn't think I needed to, and I accepted it when they told me, that's why I kind of had that little laugh. Um, so with the scans, uh, Dr. Petro actually administered my first round of chemo. Um, I can't remember, I know the first round was Contruda and then two other chemos. The only reason why I can't remember is because cancer is kind of like a trial and error where um, at this point you're not 100% sure how the body's going to respond to the particular type of chemo. Um, but while you're in the hospital, you have to receive a particular type because it's confusing. The insurance company will only approve the one type. So that's the one I went with. So the cool part about it is the one hospital didn't want to start treatments until my cough disappeared. This is where I found out the reason why I had a cough and all these other ailments and things going wrong was due because of the cancer. So going from one hospital to one that specializes in it was phenomenal. And I definitely will admit, and I'll say probably multiple times in this video, they made everything possible where they gave me a second chance. So after receiving the second round of chemo, um, I was in the hospital, everything seemed good. Came home for about, I think it was about four days. It was three days, or I lied, three nights, four days. And um, started feeling a lot of discomfort, had trouble breathing, um, got rushed back to the hospital. Ended up throwing two massive blood clots and a third one in my lung, um, which actually almost killed me. And um, at this point, um, got sent to the ICU. The reason why this was interesting is because the ICU doctors at this point wanted to intubate me because they're going off of their textbook. But when you're me, I guess I was the different, the oddball, where it wasn't necessarily to the book. It was kind of like the Marine Corps. You got the book way and then the real way of doing things. And pretty much my oncologist told the ICU doctors, producing three uh, liters of mucus a day. Within two days, I'll drown. Plus, being weak and compromised, I might not be able to get off of the intubation um, where it can hinder me as well. And the, the mucus can also lead to drowning because there's no way to uh, drain my lungs. Then, um, so my best option was to sit there 
on the high flow tube that they gave me and uh, pretty much struggled for breathing. The next, I would say probably the next six days was a struggle to breathe. But with the high flow, I was struggling to even get in the 80s at this point with my O2 levels. Um, and the lowest I dropped, where they were pretty shocked, was I believe there was a few times I dropped about 56 where I was still conscious, but I can definitely tell you, I know gravity didn't change, but it felt like life just became heavier. Um, while in ICU, um, my chemo doctors, Dr. Petro and Dr. Brantle at the time, because I was working with both of them, um, decided the best option would be to continue chemo while I was in um, ICU. The reason why this was interesting is because for the 34 days in ICU, 22 of them I was bedridden. Um, pretty much um, while being bedridden, I got down to 194 pounds for sure. That's, I know the day I got out of bed and stepped on a scale, that's what I, did, I weighed. My bed scale was saying the lowest I got was 188, but the scale said 194, um, where it was making it complicated because the more mass and size you have, um, the more um, the chemo will respond, plus got multiple articles sent later on where people that have higher muscle mass actually uh, react better to the treatments. So while in ICU, um, I was, they were still administering the chemo every three weeks at this time, and um, was going forward, moving forward with that. Um, the most interesting thing was, was um, step one, to get to the important part, uh, like with the struggle and stuff, yeah, I will admit I did go through a hard time and a struggle um, where um, 2018 wasn't my proudest year. I, I love it for what it made me. Um, I love it for what it taught me, but I can still admit I still would want to redo it if I had to. But the thing that became my staple was working out. And um, 57 days in the hospital and 22 bedridden where I couldn't get out of bed. Um, my staple was taken from me and that was probably the hardest part was because that was the only thing I thought I had control of no matter what was in a downward spiral I always had lifting to fall back on um, where at that point my hair was falling out and it got to the point where as a side note um, I can honestly admit I wasn't comfortable with the person in my skin I was almost disgusted with myself at this point when I was able to walk the first few days where I, it was a struggle to look myself in the eyes and um, when I say it was a defining moment is, one, cancer taught me actually the true beauty of life. Um, I don't have anything negative to say about it. It sucks. I don't wish cancer upon anybody. Um, I wish I didn't have it, but as I learned in the military and I've heard others say, it is what it is. You can't change the facts of what you have. So, learning to swallow that pill, accepting it, and then on top of it, you have to learn to become comfortable in your skin and confident in who you are. Um, it was also hard for me because at the time I was roughly about, when this all happened, I was about 216 to 217 and um, 22 days bedridden where I couldn't get out of the bed, dropping down to, like I said before, 194 pounds. Um, I looked emaciated. I looked, I hate to say it, not sound terrible, I looked like a starving Ethiopian um, where that staple was taken from me. So the best thing that happened was is a PT doctor came up, he brought me a hand bike, pedals. And that's where it started. The first, I think, day, two days, I can't remember, it was a day or two. Started with the pedals and then uh, my dad brought in my Xbox. And when I play Xbox, I put the little hand pedals down by my feet. I'd sit there, pedal while I was playing video games um, or watching TV. And I would try to do, uh, it wasn't much. I would try to do three sessions spaced out, like. 10 minutes of like every five hours, like riding the bike for two minutes because uh, my oxygen was so low. Um, after doing this for a couple of days, uh, there was a picture online of my son and uh, I took my first walk after uh, that 22 days uh, being bedridden and um, it felt great. Uh, it felt weak. I, I, I felt miserable to the fact was, I think we did, it struggled. I had to take a few seats around my first lap, which was, I think, might have been roughly 200 meters or something, um, where my lower back was just so sore because my muscles were gone. And, um, and that's where it started. It started with a simple bike. 
and then they brought me bands, um, little blue bands that I have over on the door. And then from bands, it turned into walking. And then from walking, um, they brought me two 40-pound dumbbells. And um, uh, there would be times where I'd be exercising in my room, and I would desat, where my oxygen levels would drop below 70. Um, where the nurses would run in, I'd be throwing up because I'd be struggling to get oxygen and everything else. But um, at this point in my life, it was like that was my staple. It was like I was in control of the, the workout sessions because everything else around me was gone. So that, that, that gave me my sanity. That was like my shrink. That was my go-to. That was my drug at the time. And, um, and it relit the passion where I can honestly admit working out before was fun. It was nice. But now this is like, I don't know, it's like it became more than just exercise. And it evolved. And um, first day back in the gym, to fast forward a little bit. Um, the first day back, I think I did 95 pounds on the squat bar for a set of like three to five. And I would desat. And then I'd have to wait probably roughly five minutes um, with my O2 sensor. I had a little pulse ox for my finger. And when my oxygen would come up to like 88 or better, that's when I'd start my next set. I actually have one of these in my gym bag. This is my home personal one. And um, sometimes when you go to the hospital, if you don't have breathing issues, they still apply this to you, so a lot of people don't know what it is. This is the pulse ox. So right now, I have air running through here. I have two liters of oxygen, and this is actually measuring my airflow through the bloodstream. And right now, I'm at 91, and so like, so you understand, so yes, my resting heart rate is a little bit higher than average. The reason why is my heart has to compensate for low oxygen levels, so it beats a little bit faster and harder. That's why I'm a huge fan of working out, is because since I've started working out, my heart rate actually has decreased, um, where it's not as high, where I would just do a simple walk and my heart rate would be at about 153 beats per minute. And, um, and at that time, my oxygen levels was a struggle around 85 to 88. We're now with assistant oxygen on two liters. I'm pulling in 92 to 93 and everything else. So this thing was my bread and butter when I went back to working out. So like when I kept saying in the beginning of the videos, where I said my pulse ox, I would do an exercise. I would drop down to the low 70s. I'd have to wear this and monitor it until I hit about 88 because that was my best before I could do my next exercise. And with that said, sometimes that would take anywhere up to three to five, sometimes eight to 10 minutes. Or if it wouldn't come back up and I was still struggling to breathe because I was so exhausted and my body felt compromised, that's when I'd call it a day and go home. Um, it's funny because people always talk about like, oh, I'm too big or I'm blah, 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 this and that. And it's like, well, I almost died. I couldn't breathe. Um, I, I take my little pony, my little portable oxygen machine to the gym and exercise. And in between the sets, I'm sucking air pretty hard, like a fat kid doing cardio, maybe worse. And, um, and that's what it's about. It's, it's not about conquering the world today. It's, it's, a, it's a process where it's like you start here, you start small, you grow, you grow, you grow, to eventually where I was doing full-blown workouts. And, um, and actually until about a month ago, when I was doing my hyper day, when I do more volume work, um, I was actually finding a good balance where I was strengthening my lungs and strengthening my muscles because um, there'd be a time where I'd either hit the lungs but I couldn't feel it with my muscles because I'd have to drop such significant weight. So it was a process in everything. And then through this, I saw there was an exciting thing. We have, I have a friend, Chaz. He was running a uh, program, Victory for Vets. And I saw at the time, I think there was like two people signed up at the time. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And when I signed up for it, it actually wasn't about the competition um, because in my mind, I don't care if I win or lose. Um, it's a competition between myself because I remember being bedridden for 22 days where 95 pounds was a struggle to squat, where um, I couldn't even, with the two chest tubes and multiple incisions I got put into my chest to get my port put in, my port adjusted, and then eventually, um, due to working out, I actually had to get my port removed because any repetitive motion um, was causing my port to flip where they administered chemo. And I straight told my chemo doctor at this point, I said, if you, because he told me, he's like, you can't train anything waist up and I don't want you picking up anything over 10 pounds. And 
when he told me that, I, I at this time I decided to go with Dr. Petro. He's a lung specialist because that's my biggest alarming concern with the illness. Um, I told Dr. Petro, I said, if you remove working out, I, I was like, other than my son, I have nothing to live for. Like this is this is my life at this point because that's literally I wake up. Um, I always joke with people. I say, I just survive to live. I go to the gym, do my business, and each day I try to increase my stamina of getting back to normal life. And um, and that's when he made the decision. He said, let's get that port out. He removed the port. He told me, with this said, I can't quit working out because working out, he said, it increases your vascularity. And as long as you have healthy veins, we can, I believe he calls it intravenous, where um, each time I get chemo, they just stick the IV with a particular gauge of needle. I think it's like an 18 or a 20 gauge. Don't correct me, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I just know it's a little bit bigger. And um, you just have to check it periodically. It's a little bit more, uh, not as safe, but um, since he knew that was my staple, he was willing to um, accommodate me and go intravenous uh, through the IV and versus the port. So constant battling of getting my right pec constantly cut open between the two chest tubes and everything else um, to get the port fixed, adjusted, and removed. Um, it was a constant struggle, but I had, I had that staple to keep my sanity. up to victory for vets it's more of a testament to myself where it's um, kind of getting treatments weekly and everything else so I get a big round and then two little rounds and then an off week to let my white blood cell kind of go back to normal to reblast my body fifth week it starts all over um, where it kind of gives you a purpose and a drive where um, it kind of, it, I won't lie, I did alter my workout a little bit where I, I kind of game in the game, focusing on the three primary lifts, bench, deadlift, and uh, squat, um, where everything's catered to that. And pretty much now it's just the progress of being better than who I was yesterday or a month ago. Or, um, and if I don't get the numbers I, I have set my goal or my plan, it's um, how far am I off? Because if I'm close, and that means I got to stay focused and keep working to move forward. Um, so right now, for my victory for vets, I definitely would say I definitely want a 365 bench press, 495 deadlift, and a uh, uh, 400 pound or 405 uh, pound back squat. Um, it's going to be close. My numbers are very close, and I'm nervous about it. But it is what it is. Go there, show up. Either you perform or you don't, but it's not the end of the world if you don't because there's always next month or the month after and you stay focused. Uh, first enrolled in the military in April, I believe it was April 16th, 2011. And uh, I went in down to the recruiting station and the reason why I bring this up is the recruiter, um, there's some fancy packages that were multiple years. And my recruiter said, if you like the Marine Corps, you can always uh, choose to re-enlist. Um, the reason why this is really funny to me is because as soon as I went in, I got selected for a special program and um, already graduated college. And how I ended up here is I initially wanted to be an officer. And uh, competing for the officer candidate school was very competitive, obviously didn't cut it. Still, my pride was on the line, always wanted to be a Marine, thought they were the best. Um, great grandfather was one during World War II. And with that said, I, uh, actually I'm not 100% sure if he was or not. I just know he had Japanese rifles in his house. So I'm assuming it's not really much talked about. But um, with that said, um, when the, uh, the, the field was very competitive, I uh, wanted to go in. So I, I got sold on the enlisted route. So fast forward a little bit um, after boot camp. Uh, school of Infantry, the only importance of that is every uh, military, you get an occupation in there. I was an 0331, 
which is a machine gunner by trait. Um, so uh, fast forward a little bit more, after that, um, after SOI was graduating, I was about to go to a unit with Lejeune and um, we were getting ready to deploy and all of a sudden I saw this tall skinny guy yelling my name as I was about to load a bus and apparently I was selected for this presidential thing which they told me before I was disqualified for. Now at this point I got selected for a B billet, I couldn't do presidential, was disqualified for it, got sent to Bangor, Washington and uh, that was in Washington State, everybody always, when you tell them Banger, they always think Maine, but it was in Washington, and it was for a personal reliability program where the Marines work hand in hand with the Navy to protect nuclear assets. Um, ended up being a blessing in disguise for the military. Uh, the only downfall is, is when I was checking in there, I found out my four-year enlistment turned into a five-year enlistment um, because I got selected for this. I was a little disappointed this time because the Marine Corps was not all dolled up how the recruiter made it seem and um, got to make the best of the situation which becomes the uh, motto where eventually later on we had this saying got to get way in it. Um, it ended up being a true blessing. The reason why I was a huge fan of Banger is because um, while I was there I went to a methods of entry which was an explosive course, close quarters combat which was a CQB course and then on top of that <clears throat> um, when I was and got a basic security guard school while I was there so I got three schools barely stood any post and then when um, I got this um, one of the Marines was telling me once you're within 16 months of uh, your unit you can submit a package to go to OCS so at that time I submitted it took about three packages my first two got thrown away by my platoon sergeant told me um, I don't rate to be an officer and typical Marine Corps stuff and I got pulled aside by a company gunny and he said you need to see the Royal Marine Corps first before um, you become an officer. So not even doing my full two years in PRP, I, I did barely, I think it was a, a little under 18 months, they shipped me to 1st Battalion 3rd Marines which is in Hawaii and uh, I was with Alpha Company and um, from there I was a squad leader. Uh, well, squad leader uh, for machine guns and eventually worked my way up to the section leader um, for Alpha Company. And from there, got, I ended up spending three years in Hawaii. It was beautiful, had a blast, and loved the job and got more additional schoolings where I became a martial arts instructor um, up to a black belt where Marine Corps' new policy, if I was a black belt, I could teach up to brown and give you hours for black, which was pretty cool. Um, teaches you how to get your butt fully whipped at, at a bar fight, really teaches you nothing, and how to front break fall. Um, anybody in the core will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the most useless fighting techniques ever. And um, from Hawaii, it was interesting. Um, after our first deployment, I got selected to become the 1st uh, Battalion, 3rd Marines, CAT uh, Team 1 uh, section leader which was probably the best job ever. Um, the reason why I love that job was pretty much 11 tactics, but in vehicles. Um, and it was, it was a true blessing in disguise. How I got it was, is I just came back after deployment, went to advanced machine gun leader course, which was, um, teaches you how to do indirect fire with machine guns. So uh, you can set up a Mark 19, like a mortar system. And we even, for one of our field events, we got a 240 machine gun where it was full defilade, which means there's a full-blown object in front of you where you cannot see your object that you're hitting. And uh, with the grazing and plunging fire without going into it and boring you, literally with the grazing fire, the round arcs, and it went over our defilade and was hitting our beaten zone um, onto the target. It took two days to figure it out, but um, the battalion master guns loved me for it so he wanted to reward me that was my reward was getting sent to the cat unit um, for that that was probably my favorite position I was in charge of 250 cal machine guns one mark 19 and a javelin and a toe and uh, the javelin and the toe also had an assistant 240 on there as well most people already know that and uh, it's pretty cool so the interesting fact is um, 
So I went for a PET scan. The whole point of a PET scan is, one, they want to see if the cancer is stabilized, or two, if it's still spreading. Um, good news is it was stabilized for my first scan, my second set of scans. It actually looks like the cells are shrinking and going in the right direction for me. The reason why this is awesome is initially the doctors, they only gave me two to four months to live um, with not high odds and then it was less than a 5% chance for one year where they said it most likely wouldn't happen. Luckily for me, um, the chemo worked and for about three and a half, almost four months, the, the cocktail that they have me on is Keytruda, uh, the Braxton, and Pexel, um, which is, the, I won't lie, the Pexel is a, kind of a mean monster. Um, people always, I always have a good laugh. They tell me I'm very fortunate, um, but I won't lie, you're always tired, fatigued. You feel like you have the flu 24 seven with the Paxil, it's, it's, a, it's a monster. So this, the reason why I have this scan up is because during your PET scan, they inject you with nuclear sugar water pretty much. I don't know the scientific terms for it, but um, the cancer cell attracts the sugar, and that's how they found out where I was affected, where the bowel duct cancer hit my bowel duct, the gallbladder, my lymph node, my liver, and then obviously the reason why I have this is it hit my lungs, where I had the two mucus producing tumors. So if you look in this midsection here, this was just demonstrating where the um, pretty much where the cancerous places were located. So initially when I went into the hospital, before any type of scan, they did two x-rays. Healthy lungs should look perfectly black and transparent like that, like up in here. Um, as I told you, my lungs looked like they were filled with cotton balls. That's why they thought it was an extreme case of pneumonia or a fungal infection. So this was the first alarming thing that they noticed. So this looks a little confusing just to understand. So I took two uh, screenshots side by side from where I was at originally to this is the original and then the left side is going to be the side where um, I was at at my most recent scan. So like I told you, black is good. This has very little black where you can see at the top of the lung, the lungs were very heavily compromised. So from here when you um, scroll through and go to the bottom of the lungs, there's a really good picture of the tumor. And with the tumor, we can actually see, so right here, that was pretty much the whole bottom portion of the lung was filled with tumors. And then whatever wasn't a tumor was filled with like a mucus and everything else, which was clouding the vision of the lungs. Now you move over to here, to my most recent scan, that little object right there is the tumor shrinking. And that actually was a really good sign um, from the doctors. That was the sign that instead from my first scan, we found out it was stabilized. So stabilized for the type of cancer I had was a huge, big step milestone. And then from my second scan, or my first scan to my second scan, when they saw it actually shrinking, that's where they knew um, my body was responding very well to the treatments. What I liked most about the military, definitely first and foremost, everybody will say it definitely was the brotherhood and the closeness. Um, it's funny, if you ever listen to motivational speakers like Simon Sinek, um, they try to emulate, and a lot of companies try to emulate uh, the military background for uh, how a company is ran and the leadership. But the problem is, is the military, you go through multiple hardships and everything with the person, which kind of like unites you and brings you together. And it's actually pretty awesome because it uh, brings you closer, actually. I could say a lot of the people I was in the military with I would actually consider closer to me than even some of my family, or majority of them as well. And I think a lot of people can relate to that on a whole. And uh, with that said, um, just how the military operated, the civilian life adjusting back, even though I didn't have as stressful as a, uh, as a uh, tour as some other individuals that were in, because um, I learned that it's the needs of the Marine Corps every time I was about to get shipped away orders or something came up and I got shipped somewhere else because that was the needs of the Marine Corps. But definitely how the turds or ship bags as we called them in the military were in the military were night and day difference above the average employees in the civilian world. Where even the turds or the ship bags you could trust with your life where average employees in the civilian world would backstab you for personal gain. The military does a good job weeding those individuals out with um, proper things that you need to achieve and rank through the their system. That was definitely the hardest, was transitioning back to the civilian life was just 
how, I guess you could say, the best word to use is like cutthroat, selfish individuals were. Um, second best thing is I was the best MOS in the Marine Corps. Uh, machine gunners, our motto was accuracy by volume, where uh, we always joked and it was about blowing our loads, literally. Um, and it was always the most fun because when we'd go to the range, we would an easy, an easy slow day at the range is one one trip behind the machine gun, you'd drop like 600 rounds of ammo in less than five minutes and then there'd be some sort of training instruction or you'd be doing a range where you'd be doing uh, coordinations of fire with fire maneuver or fire movement with the, the 11s to give them support um, from our support by fire position. Um, it was fascinating and then also probably the third thing I loved about the military was uh, when I went to my advanced leadership course um, learning the orders process and everything and you take a great deal of pride ended up even buying the Marine Corps small uh, arms manual where it's like all the different wars from amphibious to land and everything air where it talks about it where the tactics and um, that was always the fun like it was, it was fascinating because it was like a live chess mass match where uh, you're putting your brain to the test and I had a platoon sergeant in Bangor, Washington, Staff Sergeant Bacon at the time. He was actually probably one of the better uh, leaders I had where I remember it specifically he gave me two situations where there was no passing, it was 100% failure and he wanted me to realize where you failed and then when to admit you failed so you don't cost any more lives or uh, suicide for that particular mission or that lesson to be taught in that, that scenario where um, he taught me a great deal for when I went to uh, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. Um, when you get a lot of the butter bars out of OCS, they think they're the Don Johnsons of officers and they can stump you where you got the salty enlisted side that uh, teach you hands of the trade where even like additional like Staff Sergeant Garrett I remember would teach me things um, tactic wise and it's just little things that would build where you'd go to the uh, we, as cat we had this thing that was like an ismet where you have four screens that were computer screens and you sit in these fake mock trucks with fake guns and you have to go on a patrol or you have to give a patrol order um, and everything and um, during these processes you'd have to do missions of call by fire or sometimes we do leaders recon etc etc and situations would arise in these and these officers would try to make these situations crazy where they thought they were going to stump you but the cool part is your mentors would be these salty uh, war veterans that actually have on-hand experience and stories um, sometimes they'd even have pictures of the aftermath to explain the situation which they do a great deal of success of setting you up to be uh, great leaders in that situation. So what do you go by, Eddie? Ed? Edward? Chris? Are you serious? That's my pronoun. They're calling you out of that word because of Facebook. Is it really Chris? <laughs> yeah. My pronoun is Chris. Well, why, why is that first? That's my pronoun's name. That's Eddie Chris. <laughs> Oh, well, I gotta relearn that all over again. It's not even my fault, though. His street name's Christy Road, so Eddie Christy is his. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. So, Chris, good job, Chris. Good to meet you, Chris. So, when I started working out in the hospital, um, it was actually funny. I felt like a little kid. Um, they brought my PT person in. It was actually kind of funny because. Um, at first, he goes, do you know how to use this equipment? And my favorite is when he brought the dumbbells and everything. He's like, do you know how to use these? And I kind of, it was another chuckling moment where I was like, yes, they're dumbbells. You can do a lot with them. But in my mind, I thought I probably know how to do more with dumbbells than he probably did. Um, so when they brought me my gear to work out, that was the start of it. Um, I remember one night in particular, I wanted to know my max before I left the hospital because um, when you're in the hospital with trained professions, you can um, push yourself, my opinion, you can push yourself a little bit harder. So one night, um, while being weak, I had the 40 pound dumbbells and um, I was doing body weights, like the squats, into a push press. And um, I hit 10. I felt a little winded and I was like, hmm, I can go more. 15, I felt a little bit of burn in my legs and my lungs started really screaming and I was like, I can get five more. I hit 20 
and I tried squeaking one more. As soon as I did that, that's I spoke about it earlier, I desat, where my oxygen levels dropped immensely, and struggling to get air, I started throwing up um, uncontrollably into the bathroom. The reason why it was so funny is nurses came running into my room while I was in ICU at this time, and actually got a little irked at me, and I got put in grown man timeout, where um, they actually took my dumbbells off of me, and they asked me, and they said, what were you doing? And I, my exact words were to them is, I wanted to see what my max or my failure was before I felt like I was gonna pass out. So I know not to do that on my own, where the one older nurse was like, I understand your logic behind that, but that was stupid, because depriving your brain of oxygen is not good. Um, but the other nurses that were younger, and like we always talk about, they were like more to the textbook, like, no, 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 that's bad, and everything. And they're the ones that kind of like put me in grown man timeout, where they took my weights away, and um, actually had to earn them back. So the next few days, I did walk a little bit more, um, but it was pretty interesting. They brought me bands where I could um, work on my shoulders, to um, even did bands for, uh, like, because I couldn't even do a push-up at the time, not even on my knees, that's how weak I became where I would even put the band around my back, holding my hands, and do bench press with just bands, um, where I had to earn my way back to the dumbbells, and then once they brought the dumbbells back, every other day, it was, um, we were squatting, and then every other day we were doing a shoulder or like some sort of bench press and a back exercise, like a row or anything, um, where the doctors were still amazed, even, um, even when I received the first round of chemo, um, I did a full, full body weight exercise in the hospital and still to this day, um, sometimes my biggest lifts are immediately after my rounds of chemo. pushing ourselves to the test is a lot of things that the Marine Corps schools like to do is cause a lot of uh, physical discomfort into your body. And um, probably one of the most memorable was uh, when we were, I was in an advanced machine gun course and I remember they kept uh, running us, running us, running us. And the reason why they do this is because when this course started, they had over 120 individuals and they only had 60 class seats. And it might have even been a little less. So the first portion, they run a PT portion, that sends a huge chunk home. And the next test is the land nav test. So their whole goal is they have to drop the class down to what their quota is um, for graduation so that they can't have too many seats um, over the quota. So PT is a huge, huge portion. And um, I remember we were doing CASI vacs to um, running up the hill with the Mark 19 where we were having about a, a pack load out of about, I think it was about roughly 75, 80 pounds, and then the Mark 19 is roughly about 76 pounds for that uh, automatic grenade launcher that we would amount to vehicles. And then we also had to carry the, uh, the cradle and the tripod as well, where I know the tripod was 44 pounds as well. So we distribute these and um, thing is, is as the course would go on, individuals would fall out of the run, but you couldn't leave the gear, and everything was grueling. Well, I remember eventually we got to the log run, where at the time, since I was a sergeant, he told me only two sergeants on the log at a time, where four individuals were on it, and this log was over 300 pounds. We were running up the mountains of Pendleton at the time. And uh, I remember Southern California actually gets pretty cold, and after they were, we took us, I think at this point, he said we were roughly about eight and a half, nine miles into a run on the mountains with our gear and everything and the log. We came to the pole and um, there was still frost on the ground. And we had to throw the log into the pole and as the log sank to the bottom, everybody started jumping in the water. And I remember the hardest part was just being so fully exhausted and to the point where, um, even when you jumped in the water, it was like you didn't have enough energy to swim just because it felt like you were sinking. And I just remember, part of me, I won't lie, I actually just wanted to give up and lay there. And that was probably one of the most uh, memorable. 
the moments that was in there because we just pushed through, finished up everything, and then did the CASI vac um, with the log and water jugs and everything else that we had to take on the run. It was it was, it was quite memorable. But you got through it, right? Oh, yes. That was the most important part, yes. We all got through it, and then the, the best part about it is, is um, even though, um, like the thing that was nice about the military is like we always would joke um, when you go on battalion runs, we started together, we're gonna finish together, and even though it's belligerency during moto runs, that's actually their, their theory. Any type of PT session that was ran at this course, especially this one in particular, is um, even when you wanted to quit on yourself, individuals wouldn't allow you, and they would force you to start together and finish together. Um, because as, as they always said, small unit leadership, you're always as strong as your weakest link. So um, individuals would push, and if they had to, you would hold on to their packs. They would carry you um, behind them, like dragging you, um, or vice versa, you do for another individual. But um, definitely, yeah, we all had to find the courage to finish. And I know that was like the fine moment, it was like during that log run, it was just, I wanted to know more, but I don't know, it was weird. You, you just find that little extra to give that little extra push at the end to finish. So last night, got ready for bed, pretty much uh, did a little bit of a carb load, took my aminos, woke up, morning started for victory for vets today at 4.30. Um, 4.30, had uh, myself half cup of yogurt, two eggs, and an, uh, half of an avocado. And now we're here at the lifting competition with the other great gentlemen and uh, a few of the other veterans here for the event. And we're just uh, taking it as it goes. Currently just got done bench pressing. Uh, started out at 335, ended at 350, and that was the max I got from my bench so far. Yeah, over here. What do you got going for? I'm going to start at 365. Let's go. Come on. Let's 
Ocean City. He's like, that's why you don't do drugs. I, I didn't like, think he heard it. Oh, I heard he it. I just remember, I was like, don't say nothing. He's with his son. Like, <laughs> his father's an asshole. He's one of the assholes. Sure you know that, with kids there, buddy. I was like, never did a drug in my life. <laughs> Frank a little bit. Can't lie about that. Go on, Will. Go on, Will. I'm trying to walk. I'm trying to walk. 
Two more, baby. You get ten of these at least. The rubber? Yeah, yeah. I'll hold back for you. I know you got 10 and you my little ponies in the video. Right? It's gonna take longer to strap in than how many reps I'm gonna get. <laughs> yeah. No, you're good, buddy. Come on. That's Corey, Corey lifts this too, so you better get it a couple times. Let's go, Chris. Come on, Chris. Come on. One, one, two, three. Come on, Chris. Four. Good. Five, Small. six, seven, eight. Good, Chris. Come on. Come on. Nine. Come on. Yes. Come on, baby. Ten. Easy. Five. Easy. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, man. Keep going. Good. Good. Get the 15. Come on, Come on buddy. Come on. Come on, Chris. Good. Come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. Come on, babe. Good. Yeah. One more, buddy. You got it. Get tight. You got it. Get tight. Yes. Nice. Nice. My name's Andrew Clay. I just want to say the only reason I'm here competing at the Victory for Vets is because of Chris Molnar. Wrote a program about 60 days ago for me to work out with him and train legs, squat, deadlift, and bench. Uh, my bench is horrible, but his isn't. Uh, increased in strength in all of those movements thanks to him and totally inspired by the guy. Should, should have passed away by now with cancer and he will not quit, will not give up. Truly blessed to know that gentleman. Thank you, Chris. I'm Chris's aunt Susan, and I just want you—I just want you to know that um, we're very proud of Chris. He's an inspiration to our whole family. Uh, when he was first diagnosed, the prognosis wasn't very good, and how far he's come has been amazing to us. And his drive and inspiration is so awesome, and he's impressed all of us, including the doctors. Thanks. All right, so my name is Chaz. This is my fiance, Stephanie Copeland. And uh, we've been working for quite a few months to put the lift together for Victory for Vets, which our buddy Chris Molnar was a huge piece uh, in competing in this. Uh, I've known Chris now for a couple years. Uh, I work for one of the vendors, uh, Muscle Tech, and I met him when we worked at GNC. And uh, it's just been incredible to see his journey and uh, how much of an inspiration he can be just for you know every everybody to that case and uh, the story he has absolutely incredible and to see what he did today uh, defeating all odds of what he's going up against is absolutely incredible uh, to really see it's a blessing to know yeah.